video games are everywhere. Since Pong first ponged onto screens in ancient Egypt, tens, maybe even hundreds of video games have come out since then. Especially in recent years, the medium has become a fantastic vessel for storytelling, with the stories told getting bigger and bigger with each generation. And like other creative mediums before it, Hollywood has had their fair share of translating the work to the big screen. Until recently, video game movies had a reputation for being awful and bad and stupid and bad, with very few exceptions. But starting around 2019, the reputation seems to have flipped. Movies like Pokemon Detective Pikachu, Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2, uh, meow. the Super Mario Brothers movie, Mortal Kombat, and many more have been far more positively received than their ancestors. And even TV is getting their piece of the pie, with shows like The Last of Us, The Cuphead Show, and Castlevania Nocturne being met with many accolades. And in true Hollywood fashion, the train isn't stopping. Almost every studio is in the video game adaptation business now. 2024 promises a Borderlands movie and a Fallout series. Hello, Metal Husband. <laughs> Three, I'm Metal Husband. But beyond that, series like Portal, The Legend of Zelda, Bioshock, Horizon, and many more are receiving some kind of movie or TV show. So in this video, I'd like to look at some of the game series confirmed to be coming to a screen near you, no controller necessary, and give some ideas of how to adapt them, with some suggestions of stories we could see. But before we start, let's look at what types of adaptations we can expect to see. For video game movies, we've so far seen three different types of adaptations, and they're pretty much the only three we're ever going to get. First up is barely an adaptation. These are adaptations that take the name or the very loose concept of a game series and just does whatever they want with them. Characters from the original games don't appear, the storyline doesn't pass as a read of the original work, it's the type of adaptation that makes you think the people behind it played the game for five minutes but their controller wasn't actually plugged in. Examples of this from the past include Super Mario Bros. the movie, Monkey, Resident Evil, and the one that hurts the most for me, Doom. That movie decided to forego the Doom guy protagonist from the first three games, and instead took a few visuals from Doom 3, the worst one, write in a bunch of generic army guys, and make a movie based on them playing Doom 3, again, the worst one, for maybe an hour. On occasion, they'll throw the fans a bone with the occasional reference, name drop, or a cool sequence, but aside from that, they act ashamed to be adapting a game. Second on the scale is familiar faces, new places. This is where they lift not only the premise of a game series, but some of the characters too, and throw them into a new story, or at least an untold one. For example, Five Nights at Freddy's includes plenty of named characters from the games. We have Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, Mike, and William Afton. But we've not seen this specific story about Mike before, because in the first few FNAF games, not much explicitly happens. Other examples of this type of adaptation includes the Super Mario Bros. movie, taking established characters and general concepts from a bunch of Mario games and tying them into a new original story, Sonic the Hedgehog, which puts Sonic and Eggman into a mid-2000s kids movie, and Uncharted, which seems like it doesn't want to be an Uncharted movie, but still includes Nathan Drake and Sully. I'm like, literally in a Papa John's right now. And finally, there's the All Cutscenes HD adaptation, essentially retelling the game almost beat for beat. The characters you'd expect to be there are present, the story happens in an incredibly similar, if not exact same way as the game they're based on, and the additions are pretty minimal, usually there to shake it up for people who have played the game. My favourite example of this, and my favourite video game movie of all time, is Pokemon Detective Pikachu. I love the Pokemon series, my favourites being Pokemon Legends Arceus and Pokemon Shield. But I wasn't a big fan of Detective Pikachu, I find it super slow and hard to get into, but the movie tells more or less the same story in a far more engaging way. It also helps that they activated my lizard brain by specifically including a whole set piece of my favourite starter Pokemon. Garden. Apart from Detective Pikachu, there's also Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, based on Resident Evil 1 and 2 specifically, and The Last of Us, based on The Last of Us, and The Last of Us Remastered, and The Last of Us Part 1. One of these is unnecessary. Three adaptation types, barely an adaptation, familiar faces, new places, and all cutscenes HD. So. Let's choose some games and see which adaption method applies best for them. Starting off with arguably the most requested and most anticipated video game movie 
ever. If Mario is Nintendo's golden child series, Zelda is the silver. A series that has multiple games considered the greatest of their release year, every Nintendo system has an iconic Zelda game, and Ocarina of Time is to this day the highest rated video game of all time. This series has a massive reputation and a lot of games to take inspiration from. I think the way to go with Zelda is to make full cutscenes HD adaptations. Yes, plural. We're making a Zelda trilogy. This series has so many iconic stories and I think stopping at just one is downright criminal. So let me put on my Kevin Feige hat and show you my roadmap. Movie one is The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for several reasons. It's pretty much the perfect fantasy story. Link as a young elf learning about Ganondorf's evil plans from Princess Zelda, gaining a magical sword that seals him away until the time is right to find the seven sages and save Zelda and the kingdom of Hyrule from Ganondorf. Just a perfect blockbuster story. Its high status also gives it leverage. It's not like Sony are looking at Ocarina of Time and, I don't know, spirit tracks on the table. I'm really sweating over which one to choose. Plus, for the sake of the Zelda timeline, it is a big part because it's where the timeline splits. Because that means the second movie has a lot more options. Speaking of the second movie, it could adapt one of three games. A Link to the Past, The Wind Waker, or Twilight Princess. And I got aside with The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess. Don't get me wrong, I do like Link to the Past and Wind Waker, but Twilight Princess is more tightly connected to Ocarina of Time, given it's the only game in the entire series to have that game's Link show up outside of his own games. So it works as a not direct sequel, but it's more direct than any other game would be. It'd be a little bit darker and would introduce new characters like Midna. I think it'd be great to have a big twist for the audience, which reveals the curse that's been present throughout the entire series, where Ganon will always find and fight the spirit of the hero and the blood of the princess. Leading into movie three, without a doubt, will be The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The best-selling Zelda game ever, a complete reinvention of the series, and the biggest leap forward for open-world adventure games since Skyrim. It's also the point in the official Zelda timeline where all the branches converge, so it's a logical endpoint to my hypothetical trilogy. I think the story really lends itself to being the final chapter too. Instead of seeing the transformation of Hyrule post Ganon firsthand, we'd start after Ganon had already made his mark. Zelda isn't kidnapped or in hiding, but is in the castle, saving the kingdom from Ganon, who has given up a physical form to just become a being of pure energy. I like when villain characters, desperate and at the end of their rope, just let their full, untamed power loose as a last-ditch effort to get what they desire. I don't think the film would be as action-heavy as the other two, at least not for the first two acts. Instead, it'd be a bit quieter, with Link learning about the story of the princess, the champions, and himself. Because that's what the game is mostly about. Sure, there's Bokoblins and Moblins and Guardians, oh my, but the world of Hyrule is the real attraction. The ending would be, of course, the final offensive against Calamity Ganon, but I think making the final film more melancholic on the whole would make the ending of saving Zelda and finally defeating Ganon once and for all that much sweeter. Oh, son of a butt! That's not to say we should limit this just to a trilogy. The Zelda timeline is bursting at the seams with stories to tell, and this is a case where more movies would make a melancholic Breath of the Wild ending that much more earned. Not only could Link to the Past and Wind Waker get their due, but we could get Link's Awakening, A Link Between Worlds. Hell, give Link and the Faces of Evil a movie. My boy, this piece is what all true warriors strive for. I just wonder what Ganon's up to. So whichever game they decide to adapt, I say The Legend of Zelda should get the full cutscenes HD adaptation. Okay, so this is a fun one, because Pokemon has been adapted into pretty much every medium you can possibly imagine. A highly successful TV show, animated movies, numerous manga series, trading cards, plushies, a stage show. You name it, it's been Pokemon. As previously stated, I've always had a soft spot for Pokemon Detective Pikachu from 2019. While it wasn't quite and the Oscar goes to material, it was a super fun romp in a live action Pokemon world with Justice Smith, Ryan Reynolds and Catherine Newton as a great trio. It also realised how Pokemon would look in the real world perfectly by essentially taking the 3D models and slapping some realistic textures on them for better and for... Mr. Mime. In 2021, Deadline reported that a new live action Pokemon series was in the works and I really want to talk about what that could be. Whenever we get Pokemon media, barely any of it ever takes place within the worlds of the game specifically. Pokemon the first movie and its many, 
many sequels don't follow any of the events from the games, but follow on from the Pokemon anime, which I would class as being in the middle of barely an adaptation and familiar faces new places. The only media that actually adapts the core games are Pokemon Origins and Pokemon Generations. So for a new Pokemon adaptation, I'd love to see something more tied into the games. I have an idea, but it revolves around that one scary word. Prequel. Prequels can be hard. I don't think there have been many that ended up doing well, but for Pokemon, it'd be really interesting to see how the world from the games took shape. And in fact, they already started. 2022's Pokemon Legends Arceus is a prequel-ish, sequel-ish to Pokemon Diamond, Pearl and Platinum, around 150 years before those games take place. We get to see what the Sinnoh region, then called the Hisui region, was like in the past, as we develop the major locations and visit ancestors of characters we've seen in the modern day. Fans responded really well to it, so much so that we're already getting a new Legends game, Pokemon Legends ZA, set in the Kalos region. The hunger for Pokemon prequels is there. So for our live action Pokemon series, Let's do a legend style story for the Kanto region. I know most Pokemon fans are sick of the Kanto region, and I am too, but there's still potential we can milk from this already milked dry region. Last year I saw this incredible fan concept by artist Poka Yugami of a legend style game called Oak and Agatha, which would have had the player take on the role of a young Professor Oak creating the first Kanto Pokedex, complete with the old 90s art style by Ken Sugimori. I love this concept, and I think expanding it into a series would be great fun. It wouldn't be set as far back in time as Arceus, so I would say a big through line for the series could be the creation and or escape of Mewtwo. I can definitely see Oak finding Mewtwo in the Cerulean Cave at the end of the series, but instead of choosing to capture or document it, he leaves it in peace. Every episode can be set in a different town across Kanto, maybe have some visiting characters like Professor Rowan show up, explore Pokemon from outside of Kanto for a bit, there's lots of possibilities for this. So Pokemon Legends Kanto is a Familiar Faces New Places adaptation. Except it's in an old place that we've visited many, many times. Horizon is such a funny series to me. Twice now, twice they've put out mainline games only to have them release in the same window as a far more anticipated game. Horizon Zero Dawn was publicly humiliated by Breath of the Wild in 2017, and Horizon Forbidden West was put to shame by Elden Ring in 2022. Despite Sony's apparent love for humiliation, Horizon has been a ridiculously well-selling series, with Zero Dawn being the best-selling first-party PlayStation game ever. It came, it raked in money, and it left without leaving any societal impact. Truly, the avatar of PlayStation. I've never been massive on Horizon, but it's getting a TV series and it would be interesting to talk about. And a more creative challenge for me, given I adore every other series in this video, not so much Horizon. The world of the games is massive, set in a post-apocalyptic America in the 31st century. The society we know has collapsed, robots are everywhere, and humans have reverted to a simpler way of living, forming tribes and turning to the older ways of doing things, while also using robot parts every now and again. Aloy, the main character, traverses the 31st century landscape, hunting robots with her bow and scanning stuff with her Google Glass. Okay, Glass, take a picture. What are you doing? Nothing. Okay, Glass. Share with Google Plus. And I gotta say, in my experience with Aloy, I didn't personally find her all too engaging a character. Maybe it's the boring way characters interact with her, or maybe there's something missing for me, but I didn't find her awfully interesting. But that actually works really well with my idea for the Horizon adaptation, a Horizon anthology series. I think anthologies are a really interesting concept, a series of unrelated stories that can take place in different timelines, like Black Mirror or Love, Death and Robots, or they can take place in the same universe as other projects, like the cinematic masterpiece Solo A Star Wars Story, streaming now on Disney+, Plus. it's actually so good, go watch it. So let's apply the anthology idea to the vast world that Horizon gives us. There's lots of possibilities here. My mind instantly goes to a story of a character who travels the wilds repairing robots who may need the help, befriending them as they travel. We could get a tale of two members from two different clans falling in love, maybe a riff on Romeo and Juliet. We could even keep the lore-hungry fans satiated with an episode set before the robot uprising, showing the world before the games take place. And maybe, just maybe, we can have an episode with Aloy. So let's say Horizon Tales from the 31st Century is barely an adaptation, as it's more of a fill-in-the-gaps kind of dealio. Okay, really quickly, I want to do Doom justice. No, Doom is not getting a new movie or TV show at this time, but it's still my favourite game series ever. Doom Eternal is my favourite game ever, and I'm still bitter that both attempts to make a movie 
have been so bad. So I want to suggest how to make a good Doom adaptation as quickly as humanly possible. One, Doom Guy is the main character. Reaper and Joan Dark were lame. Doom Guy will rectify this. Two, the tone is not super serious. We can play it a bit silly because a one-man army fighting the armies of hell solo using a weapon literally called the Big Fucking Gun 9000 might be allowed to be a bit silly. Three, you can keep it simple and short, no problem, as long as the main crux of the story is about an angry space marine with lots of guns wiping out caco demons, imps and the like, then it's good. You don't have to bring in the deeper lore of Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, just go with a light adaptation of the original Doom story. If Sisu can make an hour and a half movie out of just action scenes, then there's no reason Doom can't either. As long as it's not barely an adaptation, then I'm happy. I just, I, I just want a good Doom movie. Now you're thinking with portals. In 2013, Warner Brothers and director J.J. Abrams promised two movies, a Portal movie and a Half-Life movie. Both series are produced by Valve and are set in the same universe, with some very small but very fun easter eggs between the two. While the Half-Life movie is seemingly comatose, the Portal movie was revealed to be part of Warner Brothers' docket. The last time Abrams mentioned it was in 2021, saying it was... And a script was finally on the rails. Now listen, I'm sure J.J. Abrams is a fine guy. I like him, I'd get a drink with him but I do not trust him as a filmmaker anymore. So let's assume that Portal is a ship and I'm now the captain who got promoted from the guy who swabs the deck. When it comes to material to adapt, there's surprisingly more than you'd think. In terms of mainline games, there's only two, Portal and Portal 2, no surprise there. And as games, they are probably as close to perfection as you can ask for. They're iconic, they have some of the most memorable characters in video game history. It has arguably the most famous AI character ever. Great songs, great stories, and fantastic gameplay. But what you may not know is that there are other canon games that fit into the Portal timeline. There's Aperture Desk Job, The Lab, Portal Bridge Constructor, Lego Dimensions, and possibly Poker Night 2. What's this emotion I'm feeling? It's like, I wish I had those cards, but I also hate you for having them. That's envy, you emotionally stunted rhomboid. And now I'm learning arousal. So, a surprisingly large pool to work with. They will not go beyond these two games. Look, I love the spin-offs, but their importance to the Portal series isn't massive. In all those games, there's a grand total of one big story event, and even then it's played for jokes. Hey there. It's me, Cave Johnson. No, no, not behind the giant head. I am the giant head. If they were to adapt solely Portal, they would have to incorporate a lot of new elements. Portal is a rather short game, around half of which is just puzzles with the occasional line from GLaDOS. The second half, breaking out of the testing track and reaching GLaDOS's chamber, is a bit more fast paced, but ultimately Portal is too light on story to solely adapt. On the flip side, Portal 2 has quite a lot of story. What initially seems like a game of similar length to the original Portal gives the player a shock when a surprise twist elongates the game a lot. We get backstory for Aperture Science, including the man behind the asbestos, a backstory for GLaDOS, and a lot of really good character moments between GLaDOS and Chell, the player character. I think the best way to adapt Portal is to adapt both games at once, with the all cutscenes HD approach. Here's my pitch. The majority of the story will be based around Portal 2, as it's the more meaty one when it comes to story. The first act is trying to escape while tiptoeing around GLaDOS until Chell and Wheatley accidentally wake her up, where the audience is then informed of how Chell killed her in the original Portal story years ago. Oh, it's you. You know her? It's been a long time. How have you been? I've been really busy being dead. You know after you murdered me. It might sound like sacrilege, but I'm gonna trim the stuff between waking GLaDOS up and Wheatley taking charge. We could definitely get shows of GLaDOS's power over the facility, maybe a chase scene to the stalemate button to replace her, where she throws everything she has at Chell because she knows what she's capable of. The second act would be navigating Old Aperture, where we could get GLaDOS reminiscing on their time together. By this point, she's been put into a potato, so she's reliant on Chell to carry her around. Maybe as she recounts memories we can watch as flashbacks, GLaDOS recounts them more fondly than they actually were to make sure Chell keeps her around. As they go, GLaDOS maybe promises that when she's back in charge, 
she'll let Chell go. Like in Portal 2, it's in Old Aperture that we'd also find out more about Cave Johnson, Carolyn, and the story of Aperture Science. The third act would be the return to current Aperture, and Wheatley struggling to keep the facility running. There's a rush to get to his lair, and his eventual defeat is inevitable. As promised, Chell is set free, and GLaDOS sends up a cake as a symbol of goodwill. So you know what? You win. Just go. It's been fun. Don't come back. The trouble with this approach is the amount of stuff that would need to be trimmed, not necessarily for the sake of length, but for the sake of pacing. So probably not a huge focus on cores that aren't Wheatley, not as many tests, and as implied, not a lot of the original Portal story. Imagining it as a two hour movie with a traditional three act structure means a lot of lore and some of the more repetitive elements will have to be left on the cutting room floor. We may also need to give characters new motivations in lieu of some of the more nuanced lore. Wheatley's turn would probably need a different motive than, I was just kind of put in this body and it inherently made me mad with power. He was designed as one of GLaDOS's original personality cores, an intelligence dampening sphere, but he was rejected. Maybe it's revenge? This one is really tricky to nail down. Portal is very dear to me and I'd never want to mess it up. So for now, I'm going to put it down as an all cutscenes HD adaptation, but ask me tomorrow and my view may totally change. Oh, and Shell can talk in this one. Thank you for assuming the party at current submission position. Before the final game I want to cover, I want to do a quick tribute to the video game movie Stuck in Purgatory that were worked on long ago but have yet to see the light of day or any kind of recent acknowledgement. Metroid is a series that's no stranger to long waits. The wait between Metroid 4 Fusion and Metroid 5 Dread was almost 20 years, and Metroid Prime 4 was announced in the Switch's launch year, only to look like it'll launch with the Switch successor now. And the Metroid movie is no different, which initially started development in 2002. Various producers and writers have been attached, and a synopsis revealed the movie would be mostly based on the original Metroid. Directors and actors in recent years have expressed interest in the project though, including Kong Skull Island director Jordan Vogt Roberts and actress Brie Larson, who cosplayed the lead character Samus Aran in 2018. Personally, I think Larson would be a great fit for Samus. She's a fantastic actress who already kind of plays Captain Marvel how I'd want Samus to be played. But until the two pair up and make it happen, Metroid is still on ice. Half-Life was revealed at the same time as the Portal movie, but J.J. Abrams has since said he's stepped away from directing the project. It's unclear if the movie was meant to be based more on Half-Life or Half-Life 2, but I'd assume it would be the second, since like Portal, the sequel is more story-heavy. No casting was confirmed for Gordon Freeman, G-Man, Alex, or any of Gordon's science team buddies. You should have not your passport, Gordon! There was also no confirmation if the two movies would be connected in any way, as both Half-Life and Portal are set in the same universe. Metal Gear Solid has been in development for a similar length of time as Metroid, but has had a little more buzz around it actually happening. Since creator Hideo Kojima announced the film in 2006, it's been a bit of an on and off production. Some big name actors were considered to play the lead part of Solid Snake, including Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale. Jordan Vogt Roberts, who previously expressed interest in Metroid, was reported to be attached to direct Metal Gear Solid in 2015. Two years later, he said the tone was tricky to get right, and since then the only announcement has been that Oscar Isaac was cast as Solid Snake. Solid Snake. That is a solid snake. This is a funny one because Sly Cooper got so far as to have a trailer. The film was announced in 2014 with a trailer following soon after. Directed by Kevin Monroe, the film would have been an origin story for the title character, Sly Cooper. However, in 2016, Monroe said the film had yet to enter production. This was also followed quickly with the president of Rainmaker Studios, the original developers of Sly Cooper, saying the box office failure of Ratchet and Clank left them reconsidering the release date and where to allocate the budget. After one final re-upload of the trailer in 2017, the film was officially shelved at the end of that year. The Bioshock series, a spiritual successor to the System Shock series, belong to the immersive simulator genre, which are games that let you interact with the world and the stories behind it more than other genres might let you. Bioshock, set in the underwater city of Rapture in an alternate 1960, I am under the water. Please help me. Was a massive hit when it released in 2007, with some citing it as the first video game to be considered art. Now, I would argue there are other games that were released before then that also deserve that honour, but I digress. The game's massive success and numerous awards led to two further games, Bioshock 2, a direct sequel, 
and Bioshock Infinite, a seemingly unconnected game until the DLC was released connecting Infinite to Bioshock. Netflix currently has the rights to adapt Bioshock into a movie, with director Francis Lawrence attached. There's no word on a release date or what the story will be about, but I'd say it's a safe bet they're looking primarily at the first Bioshock for inspiration. While the game isn't completely in your face with the story, it's clear that Rapture is a fully realised location with so much lore, history and more. Pairing that with the contents of the story itself, I really don't know what kind of adaptation would benefit Bioshock. A big part of the immersive sim genre is that it's deliberately meant to feel like you're the one experiencing the story, as opposed to stepping into someone else's shoes. And Jack, the player character, doesn't get much to bounce off of. He has some light backstory and a few reveals here and there, but for a Bioshock adaptation, he's perhaps too blank a slate. I spoke with some friends about how Bioshock should be adapted, and one of them had a great idea. Make it a prequel. Yes, another prequel, but whatever. There are official prequels to Bioshock, namely Bioshock Infinite's Burial at Sea DLC, set one year before the original game, and Bioshock Rapture, a book which chronicles Andrew Ryan and the creation of Rapture. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, I've not read the book. But this approach to Bioshock could do wonders as an adaptation. All we need is to change the medium. Instead of a movie, this could do really well as a series, like the Pokemon prequel series I pitched before. Dive a bit deeper into how Frank Fontaine came to be in Rapture, the mounting rivalry between him and Ryan, and cap off the series moments before the start of the first game. But unfortunately, we don't have a TV series to work with. It's a movie. And I'm not a super huge fan of making follow-ups to TV shows in the form of movies, looking at you Mandalorian, but maybe a straight up Bioshock adaptation is what's necessary for a TV series to also work. So we've got a double whammy here of barely an adaptation for the Bioshock prequel series and all cutscenes HD for the Bioshock movie. <laughs> After all this yapping, wouldn't it be funny if the video game movie trend went nowhere? No, I wouldn't find it funny, I spent a long time on this video. Although I do wonder if the bubble will burst sooner than anyone's expecting. The downtick in the superhero trend, at least for now, coinciding with an uptick in the video game movie trend, seems to suggest that's our big fad for the next few years, like how westerns, fantasy and superheroes have defined specific decades of cinema. Salted pork! But there's no way of telling right now. There are still a tremendous amount of iconic games and game series that I'm surprised haven't been visited yet in film, and some series definitely feel like a revisit as it wouldn't hurt. We have seen the trend broaden their horizons though, adapting more than just games themselves, but also stories about the games as just games, and about the people who make the games. Personally, I'm ready with my pitch for the next step forward for video game movies. Movies about the game consoles themselves. Here, check out my teaser trailer. Gentlemen, I come before you today with an idea. We need to bring families back to the television. They, they, they don't get enough of the television nowadays. Xbox, Nintendo, PlayStation, Sega. They're not the big draws anymore. We have to fill that gap. I ran the tests a thousand times. I'm telling you, the television is dead. Trust me, pal. You never played nothing like this. What is this? The future. God. This technology could change the world. Oh yeah, buddy.